Good evening. Distinguished guests, uh, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm really delighted to welcome you all here this evening to our first behind the headlines discussion of the autumn and the first of the new academic year. So everybody had a very productive summer. It's a myth that academics don't work in the summer. I know it couldn't be busier for me. And, and, and Joan, I know you know that too. So uh, uh, we're really thrilled uh, this evening to have such a distinguished uh, panel of speakers bringing together very diverse uh, viewpoints from across the humanities and uh, beyond academia. My name is Jane Oldmeyer, and I have the privilege of being the director of the Trinity Long Room Hub, which is our Arts and Humanities Research Institute. Tonight's event is part of our Behind the Headlines uh, public discussion uh, series. It's supported by the John Pollard Foundation, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Stephen Vernon uh, here this evening. Uh, through this uh, forum, we discuss topics uh, either that are being debated in the media uh, or that are highly pre uh, prevalent uh, in the times in which we're living. What we really want to do is to take insights, uh, uh, and here I say insights, and I really mean the long-term perspectives of the arts and humanities, and to provide a space for respectful public uh, discourse, embracing nuance and um, combating simplification, something that we think is more pressing now than ever in an era when debate has become so partisan and so uh, divided. So a decade on from the start of what will be remembered as a dark period in our state's uh, history, we revisit Ireland's <coughs> banking crisis and consider its impact and its legacy and what lessons, if any, uh, have been learned. Um, tonight, we're honoured to have a great panel of speakers from the world of journalism, I hope, Seven Cars, well, I'm hoping is still joining us, um, politics, regulation, and our own uh, humanities uh, perspectives. I'm also very conscious that colleagues are joining us online, and those of you, we, we live stream everything, and just for everybody to be aware uh, that we are live streaming uh, this event. Uh, my discipline is that of history. So I'm always delighted when we have a historian on the panel because I think it's all uh, too easy to forget uh, what came before. And while austerity and debt created an unbearable situation for far too many people in the aftermath of the banking crisis uh, and obviously the, the immigration that devastated many small communities around Ireland, if we go back to the famine in the mid-19th century, we can put our recent crisis in some sort of context. And that's exactly what our first speaker tonight, uh, uh, Antonia Hart, will be doing. I don't know, has, have people seen the film Black 47? No, I, I you have, yeah, I, I'm looking for, well, I'm looking forward to, I am looking forward to seeing it. I believe it's, it's, it's extremely well done, but I haven't actually seen it. But I think the famine is a particularly important moment, actually, to be reflecting anyway. Uh, on that. So Antonia is in our Department of History. Uh, she'll take us back to the mid-19th century, looking at the role that debt and credit played in the lives of very ordinary people uh, in the aftermath of uh, the Great Famine. Uh, she actually is doing a PhD, though, on something a little bit different. She looks at Irish women running businesses um, in the late 19th century up until the foundation of the state and Antonia is a Government of Ireland Irish Research Council uh, scholar. She's also an early career researcher based in the Trinity at Long Room Hub. I hope Simon Carswell is also going to be joining us. Do we know if Simon's coming? He's running a little late. He'll be here by 7. Oh, well, maybe he won't be our second speaker, but if he's here on time, he'll be our second speaker. If not, he'll be our third. But uh, Simon Carswell is also joining us this evening. He's the public affairs editor of the Irish Times and was finance correspondent from 2007 <coughs> to 2012, obviously covering the financial crash. Uh, he was named a National Journalist of the Year in 2011 uh, for his coverage of the crisis, and he's the author of two 
books on the banking uh, scandals and uh, uh, Anglo-Irish uh, Bank. Apart from being an authority on the banking crisis, he's also a history graduate from Trinity. So again, it's lovely to have another historian. And his talk uh, will focus on the lessons learned or not learned uh, uh, from uh, the crisis. Our third uh, panelist this evening is uh, 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 Joan uh, Burton, TD, who probably needs no introduction from me, but I will say a few words anyway, because she's the Labour Party TD for Dublin West. Uh, and she was the Labour Party spokesman uh, on finance from 2002 to 2011. Um, and uh, in uh, uh, September 2008, she was a major critic of the bank guarantee and the subsequent uh, legislation. Deputy Burton served as the Taunashta and leader of the Labour Party from 2014 to 2016 and has held a number of ministerial uh, roles, most recently as Minister for Social uh, Protection. And tonight she's going to be looking at the political backdrop to the bank guarantee and the uh, speculative uh, property uh, bubble and the tax incentives which preceded the crash. Fourth, um, our fourth panelist tonight is Ed Sibley, who is Deputy Governor of Prudential Regulation at the Central Bank. As Deputy Governor, um, uh, Ed is responsible for leading the supervision of banks and credit unions, insurance firms and asset management, the asset management uh, industry. And his talk will provide a regulatory perspective, 10 years on, looking at how regulatory reform since the crisis have increased the resilience of the financial system, but also looking at the legacy issues which continue to challenge the regulatory environment. Last but not least um, is uh, Philip Coleman, who is from Trinity's School of English. Uh, Philip, and you may have heard him on Arena last night, but he's a specialist <coughs> in uh, American literature with a particular interest in 20th century and contemporary poetry. Uh, and short fiction. And tonight he'll be asking how um, uh, Irish and other poets responded to uh, the banking crisis over the last uh, decade. So Philip's looking at the human perspective behind the crisis um, and he'll ultimately address the bigger question of the relationship between poetry or art and money and the broader questions of value and, and culture. So we've got five panellists, which is actually a little bit unusual. Those of you who are regulars here know that normally we have four, which means everybody's going to be very, I'm going to be very strict. I'm a strict timekeeper at the best of times, but tonight it really is, each speaker has nine minutes, and only nine minutes, and I know many of them could speak for an hour each easily, um, but we do want to leave time for Q&A and for uh, discussion. Um, uh, and you will have your opportunity at the end um, uh, to ask our speakers uh, or our panel uh, questions. Just as I'm asking them to be brief, I'm going to ask you to be brief and ask very clear and direct and succinct uh, uh, questions. So just to remind you again, we're being, everything's being podcast tonight and uh, live streamed. Uh, if you'd like to join the conversation online, please use the Twitter uh, hashtag HelpMatters. There it is there. Um, uh, so for now, please join me in welcoming our first uh, speaker, uh, Antonia Hart. Antonia. Thank you, Jane. So, ten years on. It's extraordinary, really, to reflect on that interval and all that's happened since 2008 and before it. Credit cards, mortgages, car loans, they seem so much like products of the way we live our 21st century lives. But credit and debt have always been with us, and it's perhaps worth considering this before embarking on tonight's analysis of more recent events. I'm going to look right back to the middle of the 19th century to what was, of course, the most significant crisis in our national history, the famine. And starting from there, I'd like to look at the place that debt and credit have occupied for so long in the lives of ordinary Irish people. There can be no one in this room who is not familiar with the famine. Six years of hunger, deprivation and disease that killed a million people 
and saw another million emigrate. In 1849, the Poor Law Commissioners began an information gathering exercise to assess the effects of the famine. As part of this exercise, they sought specific local intelligence from the pawnbrokers in each Poor Law Union. It seems tone deaf at the very least for the authorities to gauge the distress of a diseased and starving people through their contact with money lending institutions. But pawnbrokers around the country made their reports, writing about what they had witnessed over the previous five years. Their business had always been seasonal and in rural areas had tracked the farming year. But by the autumn of 1847, Honoria Shannon, pawnbroker in Gert, could hardly lend at all. She said, People became so poor and their pledges so valueless that in fact no money could be lent them on the pledges they took to the office. The same story was told elsewhere. Those who did still have items against which they could borrow small sums were increasingly unlikely to redeem them. In Nina, the pawnbroker had for three years largely refused items, knowing that they would be left on his hands, unredeemed and unsaleable. In Kilrush, by 1848, redemptions had dropped to one in 20 items, and the locals described as all but naked. Discussion about whether rapacity on the part of pawnbrokers exacerbated people's experience of the famine is ongoing. At the time, and afterwards, outside the specific context of the famine, there was prolonged public debate about the industry, focusing mainly on the hardship imposed by high interest rates and the refusal of many pawnbrokers to submit to the regulatory requirements which were a condition of their licence. Inquiries into the industry were conducted, reports were written, legislation was promised, but actual legislative reform did not materialise until 1966. Sounds familiar? <laughs> During the second half of the 19th century, credit accounts in shops were absolutely every day for ordinary people, at a time when shopping and the provision of services were done locally and your creditworthiness could be assessed by the shopkeeper's eye rather than by scrutiny of your financial records. The records of this kind of debt can quite often be found in surviving day books and ledgers. To take an example, Hannan's was a family business in Limerick, incorporating a public house and off-licence, a grocer's and an undertaker's. The surviving ledger covers 15 years of business from 1891 and gives a good picture of typical customer accounts. At the grocers and the off-licence, most of the customers lived locally and were in and out of the shop almost every day, buying on credit necessities like milk, tea, bread, butter, sugar, jam, candles and oil, as well as drink, usually in the form of bottles of stout and whiskey. Customers settle their debts every six weeks or so. The Hannans ran their funeral business on quite a different basis. Almost every single funeral, from cheap to lavish, had to be paid for in full at the time. The exceptions were workhouse funerals. The business from the workhouse was so brisk that it warranted its own section in the ledger, and credit was given on those coffins with the workhouse account being settled every three months by cheque. So credit was usual for getting your daily goods, but you couldn't get everything on credit, and if you weren't in a position to settle up at the agreed intervals, credit might be denied you in future. There was always a need for cash, and the easiest way to produce cash at short notice was the pawnbroker's shop, a place where, unlike a bank, it didn't matter that you were a woman or poor or otherwise marginalised. There was no credit check, almost no paperwork, and you could walk out in a matter of minutes with cash in your pocket. But of course the interest payments became a regular burden, and what was intended as a rapid response to a condition of precarity ended up being a contributor to the condition of precarity. You could still, until 1872, be imprisoned for debt, there was an ongoing campaign to abolish this, 
and that campaign intensified in 1860 after 20-year-old Mary Cocky, who was imprisoned in Belfast over a debt of £26, which she had incurred in buying furniture, died by suicide in jail. John Ray, who appeared at the inquest on behalf of her next of kin, said, I address a jury of my own townsmen, most of them small shopkeepers engaged in business, when they are obliged to give credit to the working classes. Any man here may be brought to this jail. The more extensive a man's business may be, the more readily may he find himself suddenly brought to poverty. Imprisonment for debt was eventually abolished, but the problem of this obligation to extend credit persisted. Often fatally burdening small businesses who were trying to manage their own line of credit with suppliers. If you weren't able to balance your books, you could find yourself served with a petition of bankruptcy. The Belfast bankruptcy records, dating from 1888 on, detail the lost struggles of thousands of small businesses. And this is a pattern that comes up again and again. There are numerous examples in the bad debt columns, particularly of hoteliers and shopkeepers, who have given credit without even taking the customer's address. And of course, that was money they would never see again. If you're unable to pay your suppliers, but unable to garner what is owed to you, you probably end up looking for some form of bridging loan. And the bankruptcy files indicate that women, at least, frequently borrowed cash within the family, most often from a parent or sibling, but also from business connections, like a supplier or landlord. But of course, their very presence in the bankruptcy files indicates that at some point the seams began to give. So, while a functioning system of credit was essential to daily life for so many people, however hard you worked, it could lead to a rapid unravelling of your business over fairly small sums of money. Credit didn't cover everything. You might get a cash loan, you might make a trip to the pawnbrokers to alleviate an immediate need, but you'd be left with problematic interest payments. Domestic debts were usually for basic foodstuffs and domestic supplies. And for businesses, it was so frequently the failure to pay for these basic supplies and services that tested the elastic limit between credit on the one hand and debt on the other. The reality of this normalised credit economy, this long-standing way of living and doing business, was that it placed an almost constant cyclical burden of debt and repayment on ordinary people, a burden which they had to discharge repeatedly, not to oversupply themselves with material comforts, but simply in order to keep the show on the road when it came to food and rent and clothing. A painfully recognisable picture. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. In many ways, in terms of the era we're talking about, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. If you look at the period from roughly 2002 up to 2007, when really we came to the height of the bowl, for a lot of people, it was and it felt like the best of times. But when you come to the crash, 2008, uh, out particularly to about 2012, uh, when the first signs of recovery really began, it was probably for many people in Ireland uh, one of the most difficult periods hopefully they would ever experience in their lives. 330,000 people lost their jobs, thousands of firms uh, closed, particularly SMEs as creditors lost the ability to repay, and the construction industry which had been the driver of the Irish economy to the uh, extent that it took an enormous set, uh, amount of the economy, just literally went through the floor and with it, the livelihoods of vast numbers of people in the construction industry. So when we look at the early 2000s, I suppose the standout event is that Ireland, in, in around 2002, joined uh, the euro. Uh, it had made the, the agreement to join it around 1999, but it actually came into effect from there. And of course, immediately, it unleashed really a, a lake of credit that was available uh, to banks 
uh, in a way that simply had not been available before. Uh, the same was true in relation to the developers and uh, the construction firms who relied on banks and financial institutions. <coughs> in fact, allied to that, which was really what made the situation ultimately completely unsustainable, was that our tax laws, uh, through a whole series of reliefs and exemptions uh, and special tax structures, positively threw money at people who invested in property, land and construction. And, you know, developers' helicopters, for people who are younger, they literally buzzed over race meetings uh, because it was a sign of the times. Um, the Charlie McCreevy famously said at that time, when I have money, I spend it. But in fact, we were living in a bubble, but it wasn't a bubble, if you like, that people particularly recognised. Because they take, you know, ordinary people who aspire to buy a house and went about <coughs> doing that. House prices went up dramatically, uh, but the, the bank credit uh, was available uh, to support that. Uh, and your local bank was very friendly indeed, your local financial institution, regularly popping, popping un unasked for messages in the door to say your credit was good for quite startling amounts, really. Um, so, in 2003, I became the uh, Labour Party's spokesperson on finance because I told Pat Rabbit I wanted the job. I was probably, in my view, at the time, the only person qualified to do it and became, if you like, the only woman spokesperson on finance uh, in a major party <coughs> and uh, during a lot of that era. And I do want to point out that while there were Lehman brothers, at the time there were very few, if any, Lehman sisters. And I think it's important to recognise, uh, and perhaps Ed can comment on this, that uh, financial markets, there's a lot of t t testosterone there. And people who are taught uh, to uh, trade, you know, the key thing is to really have that kind of gambling instinct and basically hope that everything uh, will turn out all right. Um, Gordon Gecko famously said, greed is good. And that became the motto of the global uh, finance capitalism, which really reached a new level at that point in time. Anne Enright uh, wrote an interesting novel around them uh, called The Forgotten Waltz. And uh, I don't know, some of you here may have read it. But the couple in the novel buy a shoebox house somewhere on the outskirts of Dublin. And literally at one point, uh, the guy in the relationship can feel he can hear the money value of his house growing as he lies in bed. And that says it all. This was an incredible sense of well-being. Ask yourself at the moment, are Irish people delighted that property prices are rising again? Somewhere a great well of well-being almost comes to people with that feeling. They may not want to realise it, uh, but remember, the banks had lots of sayings then. You know, release the equity in your, prop in your property uh, so that you could borrow. A couple coming in who already had an apartment were getting married, maybe lectures in Trinity. The bank said, keep the apartment, buy another house. And uh, I used to, as, as somebody who worked in the DLT, be regularly asked by people, should I do this? Uh, but the banks always said, go for it. Uh, so individuals, in a certain sense, became, uh, some of them, uh, if you like, speculators uh, in an unthought-out way, urged on by the bank. <coughs> September uh, 2007, and I just want to reference 2007, the Wall Street Journal described Ireland as being the Wild West uh, of capitalism. And that was a seminal moment. And actually, I think very few people in the banking structure paid much attention. And an interesting thing happened then in September 2007. A local principal teacher, one of the primary schools in my own area, rang me up and said, Joan, I have the school savings uh, in Northern Rock. Do you think I need to go down and get the money out? And some of you may have remembered debates on Joe Duffy at the time, uh, where people were literally queuing in large numbers in the UK to take their money out of the bank. 
but in small but significant numbers unheard of in Ireland to do that in Ireland. So, you know, breaking, uh, uh, as it were, uh, the whole consensus of silence, the fundamentals are sound. I can remember meeting bankers at the oil committees whose hands were literally dripping with sweat, but the fundamentals were sound. And you try to put the two together. Come the uh, night of the bank uh, guarantee, my difficulty with the Department of Finance was when I went in, and uh, you know, I have a background uh, in business in the sense of originally working as a chartered accountant. I kept being told that I didn't really understand essentially the financial genius of people like Sean Fitzpatrick uh, and of uh, people like Sean Quinn. I didn't understand their model. Now, I have to confess, the more the Department of Finance intimates things like that, the more I feel I'm really not going with a blanket bank guarantee that these guys are proposing. Yeah, yeah. And so the Labour Party decided to oppose the bank guarantee. And interestingly, uh, a number, th there was very little left participation, to be honest, in the discussion. That all came a lot later. So, just uh, moving to now, are there things we should be aware of? I saw a little article in the papers at the weekend that uh, the central bank may be looking for consultants to uh, give a view on whether or not bankers, senior bankers' salaries should be allowed to go above the half million mark, uh, plus a 25% package alongside that. Ed could confirm if that's likely to be true. I think we actually need now to focus on you know, the fallout. Without a doubt, the most difficult part of the fallout is what has happened to housing in this country. From being a, a country where most of the audience here at some stage could aspire the young, younger part of the audience to buy a house by their late 20s or early 30s, that's now shifted almost out of reach. And if you're uh, one of the many tens of thousands of people on social housing lists, and you're talking to somebody like me, unless there are medical circumstances or other ex exceptional circumstances, or actual homelessness, the chance of getting a place of your own through social housing is almost zero for at least the next five to eight years. And yet, all of these people uh, are people who work hard uh, and who constitute probably at any one time 30% of our population who need support. It's all our concern for each other expressed socially through the social and political supports that we have in our place, or have in place, or should have in place in Irish society, that initially appear to be wrecked <coughs> and subsequently have taken a very long time to repair and that make casualties of so many tens of thousands of Irish people of the, of the uh, bank crash and disaster. Thank you. Thank you. Simon Carswell is my name, I'm um, Public Affairs Editor with the Irish Times. I was previously Washington Correspondent and before that Finance Correspondent, which qualifies me to speak here tonight. Um, I want to start with a story, a personal story, and this comes from well behind the headlines. It was Saturday, September 20th, 2008. It was 10 days before the government introduced a 440 billion euro guarantee to plug the hole in one bank at the time, Anglo-Irish Bank, to stop cash draining out of what was the country's third largest bank. Uh, and that Saturday, I went fishing um, in Connemara. I didn't catch anything, but that doesn't matter. It isn't about fish. But the month of September 2008 was a crazy time to be working as finance correspondent at the Times. Wall Street Bank Lehman Brothers had collapsed the previous weekend. And after a busy week at work, I decided to jump in the car and head to Galway to take my mind off things for an overnight trip. 
but work followed me to Connemara. After a day fishing, um, my companion and friend suggested that we meet an elderly, long-time friend of his family. He'd been a very successful businessman, but had long since retired and was at this stage well into his 80s. And he was enjoying quiet weekends away in sleepy Connemara hotels. My friend had mentioned a few days earlier that this elderly friend, let's call him Johnny, wanted to catch up with us. But after we were well into our pints, Johnny asked my friend if he could chat to me privately for a few moments. It was a sudden and sharp shift away in our conversation about fishing. But once we were alone, Johnny leaned in and he asked my advice. He almost whispered that he had a substantial sum of money in deposit at Anglo, in Galway, money he'd set aside for his grandchildren. And his manager at Anglo at the time uh, told him that he would give him a more generous deposit rate than he was on then if he put all of his fortune on deposit at the bank. Now I got the impression that the substantial sum in deposit at Anglo was maybe a million euro and he was on a rate of a little over 5%. The banker was offering 6% if he moved his entire nest egg to Anglo, and I suspect that that nest egg was millions. What surprised me most was here was a clever businessman who had clearly managed his money exceptionally well years after his retirement, asking the finance reporter for a new, from, from a newspaper for advice. Now I made it clear to him that I was not in the business of giving advice, though I noted that the Minister for Finance, Brian Lennon, had at that point, that day, just raised the deposit guarantee to 100,000 euro. So if he spread his money around various institutions, his money would be safe, it would be guaranteed. And it seemed to provide some comfort. Johnny nodded and our friend rejoined us and we carried on talking about fishing. I've reflected on that conversation from 10 years ago many times in the intervening period. And what has stayed with me most is that this was a moment when a long time customer of the bank had completely lost trust in a financial institution. The Anglo manager's uh, offer seemed too good to be true, and Johnny's gut told him that it was, but still he wanted assurance, and yet you could see that the trust was gone. He was shaken by the offer. It was an act of desperation by the bank and the customer senses. Ten years on, we know at that time that panic had gripped the bank internally. The word credit comes from a Latin root word, cred, it means belief, or believe. When we deposit our money in a bank, we believe it is in safe hands. At that moment, ten years ago, Johnny stopped believing. Johnny was not alone, and 10 years on, and several years after Johnny's death, and after a 64 billion bailout of the banking sector that helped push the government to seek its own bailout, many people still not, do not believe in their banks. And I think it will take many years for some to start believing again. In May, when the communications agency, the reputations agency, released their rep trap study on the most highly regarded organizations in the state, guess where the country's banks featured? Out of 100? Permanent TSB 88th, KBC Bank 89th, AIB 90th, Ulster Bank 92nd place, Bank of Ireland 93rd. There was only one other financial institution that featured below these banks. In 94th place, the Central Bank of Ireland. <laughs> the institution charged the regulating banks. And if you're wondering that after all we have been through here in the country in the last 10 years, that no institution that handles people's money is going to figure very highly in the survey, well think again. In first place, the organisation that held the highest regard in terms of the public's trust, admiration and esteem were credit unions. In second place was Kellogg's, so credit unions and cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> the things we trust most. <laughs> the damage to trust is alongside the actual tab the taxpayers picking up for the bailout is the most costly legacy of the banking crisis. The 2008 to 2010 financial crisis was so severe that it resulted in the Irish state taking ownership of the majority of the banking system and putting the financial system on life support in what I believe is the biggest public policy decision by a government in 21st century Ireland, maybe even ge in generations. The crisis led to the liquidation of the two most reckless institutions, partial and almost full state ownership of the remaining four domestic institutions, criminal convictions against unlawful transactions uncovered in the wake of the crisis, and a change of management in almost all of the other institutions, along with new rules to rein in the excesses of a runaway banking sector. The Republic will recover a good chunk of the 64 billion put into the banks. So of the 29 billion put into AIB, Bank of Ireland, and permanent TSB, the so-called living banks, almost 19 billion has been recovered. And the public stake in, the three, in those three banks, based on share price at last month, stands at 11 billion. So we're about a billion shy on those three. But the worst, in the worst cases, almost all of the 35 billion in public money pumped into Anglo and Irish nation is gone and won't be coming back. And just to be clear, the 64 billion does not cover the full scale of the carnage in Irish banking from the crisis. 
you add the UK owned Ulster Bank, Bank of Scotland, Ireland, and the other foreign lenders, the real cost of the banking crisis soars over 100 billion. That is often forgotten. And to put that in context, the annual budget of Our Lady's Hospital, Children's Hospital in Crumlin, is about 140 million. So you could run that hospital for 725 years with the same money lost on Irish banks in the financial crisis. They're depressing statistics. Sure, we can repair our banks, fix the rules of banking, give our regulators more teeth, teeth that they may even use sometime, and create living wills so we can bury bad, dead banks and let bondholders pick up this undertaker's expenses as they should. But how can you rebuild the trust? And, by the way, the damage to trust goes way beyond the balance sheet of banks in the state, but trust in other institutions. It took me four years in the United States reporting on the rise of Donald Trump and another year and a half back home covering Brexit to confirm for me that the post-financial crash anger fed into the populist anti-establishment energy that helped elect a snake oil salesman as President of the United States and encouraged British people to believe that they would be better off outside one of the world's biggest markets right on their doorstep. Trump and the Brexiteers were all about you can't trust the establishment. Leading Brexiteer Michael Gove saying people have had enough of experts. Trump saying I alone can fix this to all America's problems. That was fueled by a distrust in institutions, and I can't bind some of them. Rebuilding trust, I believe, starts with accountability, and it follows that to achieve accountability, you have to hold people to account. A common refrain you would hear in the initial years after the crash was, sure, nobody's going to, go, going to be held to account. Nobody will go to jail for bad or excessive lending. And yes, that's correct, and provenly correct. Five bankers, four from Anglo and one from Irish Life and Permanent, were convicted in jail, but none over any issue that caused the collapse of their institutions. Four of them have done or are doing prison time because of unlawful transactions that took place in the months before the collapse. As Judge Karen O'Connor stressed when she sentenced former Anglo Irish Bank Chief Executive David Drummond to six years in prison, she said that she was not sentencing Drummond for causing the financial crisis or the recession which occurred after it, but for specific offences that did not cause Anglo's collapse. Hubris and incompetence are not crimes. If they were, our, business, our prisons might have seen many more bankers pass through their doors. No banker went to jail for failing to see the risks building in their business by approving four in every five loans to the property market. No banker went to jail for failing to set aside enough money to cover problems within their loan banks. No banker went to jail for relying on increasingly complex money markets or even understanding how those markets worked to source the funding for half of their loan books. No banker went to jail for pouring more fuel in the fire by offering 100% mortgages in an already red hot property market. No banker went to jail for allowing future profits in one unfinished housing development in lieu of equity, a cash deposit essentially, to help purchase land for the next housing development, turning a bank into a house of cards. Angle. That is why we need strong regulators to keep banks on a tight rein to show action and for them to show action, strength and skill, and to protect against and get out ahead of those risks. But rules only go so far. The tracker mortgage scandals show that even after a crisis, banks had still not changed their ways. The failure to put customers back on lower rate tracker mortgages that they were entitled to has resulted in the banks incurring charges of about one billion in the country's biggest ever bank overcharging scandal coming years after the crisis that we mentioned. Documents that I've seen show that the banks believe that they were that with the right formula of words and the right legal advice, they could support actions that, that were not in the interests of their customer, the best interests of their customer. Old habits die hard. As the Anglo cases show, bankers have a habit of hiding behind legal advice, or trying to. As long as you have a brief from a senior counsel in your back pocket or shop around for the right legal advice, you're covered. The tracker scandals show the us versus them attitude bankers have shown towards their customers. The central bank, rather relatedly this year, with the help of the Dutch Central Bank, looked at the culture within Irish banking, given how the tracker mortgage scandal had shown that their behaviour was not in the right place, as they said, and their attitude was more do the legal thing than do the right thing. It was depressing, really. The regulator found the Irish banks were stuck in a firefighting mode still, and it slipped back into command and control management structures and silo decision making, which is a recipe for disaster because if you're in charge, you're likely to know where the problems in your bank lie if your bank is in silos. So that's the diagnosis, but what's the cure? Well, individual bankers need to be held accountable for their actions. Decisions need to be traced back to individuals. So much, so much of the disastrous pre-crisis decision-making seemed to rest with collective groups, bank boards, for bank management teams, the central banks. Banks, in my view, should be viewed more like big utility companies, like power plants, providing a vital civic service, and so expectations should be adjudged accordingly, so they are bound to serve the customer and ultimately society. 
Maybe banks should not be as profitable as they were. Maybe mortgages should not be as high, uh, uh, not such high rates. Maybe banks should be steady, boring, and predictable. Yeah. Maybe they should return to that traditional banking and that banking 363 model. Take in deposits at 3%, lend out at 6%, and all be done in time to be on the golf course by 3 p.m. <laughs> it may not make you a millionaire as a banker, but at least it would not lump billions of euros of losses on your public. Where bankers are paid handsomely, they, they, their pay should be tied to long-term sustainability. Where there are future losses, their pay and bonuses should be clawed back in future. Anglo is an example. Drone was paid 13 million in salary and bonuses between 2004 and 2009. Sean Fitzpatrick earned 9.3 million in his final four years as chief executive. Neither man paid any of that back, although they ultimately filed for bankruptcy, un unable to pay the burden of their heavy, heavy borrowing from Anglo. Other bankers have held on to their Celtic era pay and pensions. How radical a proposition would it be to ask bankers to repay salaries and bonuses commensurate with the losses of the institutions they manage if they are paid salaries and bonuses commensurate with the profits of those institutions? Here's another proposition. The SEC in the US pays whistleblowers who, originally, uh, who provide original information that lead to uh, convictions on illegal practices between 10 and, 10 and 30 percent of the money recovered. As of last week, the SEC had paid out at least 320 million dollars to 57 tipsters since launching the program. The biggest award, uh, the 93 million award, was paid to one tipster in particular. So I'll leave you with this. My first day as finance correspondent of the Irish Times was reporting on the first run on a, on a British bank in more than 100 years. One of my last columns as finance correspondent was about the suicide of a businessman I knew who had taken a heavy leverage position on anger, hoping that shares would rise. It was a dramatic crisis that took a devastating toll on people and families. A crisis that some families are still struggling, struggling to recover from, and from which some families will never recover. That is something we will hopefully never forget. Ten years, twenty years, or many years after this day back. Up. We don't forget the causes of the crisis, um, and we continue to learn the lessons from them. Uh, otherwise, we will be condemned to, 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 to repeat them. Um, a couple of themes have come up in terms of diversity, in terms of trust, uh, in terms of culture, in terms of accountability, all of which I would agree with. Um, I, I would just correct Joan, just, just uh, briefly, it's the Department of Finance who have hired the consultants on bank and pay, and that's a matter for the Iraq, it's not for, for, for the central bank. <laughs> So, so, sorry, that was the newspaper. Yes, that's that's the newspaper. Newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just, just, uh, just a moment of clarification, just to say that my, my full marks will be published on the Central Bank website for, for, for the reference as, as is our, our, our annual practice. Um, I, I, I touched on there the importance of, 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 of remembering, um, and I will touch on the, the causes. I'll talk a, a little bit about the crisis itself, touch some of the ground that Simon's covered. I'll talk about what has changed, and I think it's important that we do talk about what's changed, and I'll, I'll spend a, a very brief amount of time uh, looking forward. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very clear, with the benefit of hindsight, that there were multiple causes of the crisis. It was an international financial crisis. Um, there were problems with supervision, problems with financial engineering, problems with behaviour, problems with, problems with bank management, uh, problems with um, uh, over-indebtedness, problems with rating agencies, um, issues with um, uh, budget, budgeting, with macroeconomic policies, tax policies that uh, Joan has talk, talk, talked about. And, and this allowed, as uh, the head of the IMF has uh, as recently said, financial institutions, including, including banks, to go on a frenzy of reckless risk taking. That's what, that, 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 that is what happened leading up to the, uh, to the crisis. In, in Ireland, there are specific factors that made the crisis deeper and worse. Part, part of that is the susceptibility of Ireland to the economic cycle, uh, because of the, the small open nature of the, of the economy. But there was also policy decisions. Uh, around the budget, about relying on transient in, uh, income. There were absolutely regulatory and supervisory failures in Ireland, and there was also a failure to act. So in, in other words, a myriad of decisions, decisions to take actions, decisions not to act, 
um, all built on implicit and explicit assumptions that led to the created the environment that led to the, led to the crash. And it was a, a, a classic credit credit fuel um, asset bubble in, in Ireland. These are as old as 400, at least 400 years old, and in, in Ireland it happened to be happened to be property. And when the, the global markets started to retreat, started to get scared, started to retreat to safer assets uh, in two, 2007, and then increasing speed in 2008, and then a, a light speed after Lehman's brothers in September 2008, there was no soft landing for, for the Irish banks, there was no soft landing for the, for the Irish economy, you know, plummeting uh, property prices, a spillover to the, to the rest of the economy, which Joan has talked about, Simon's talked about, and massive distress for, for borrowers, massive distress for people who lost their jobs, um, and a, 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 a severely weakened uh, fiscal position for, for, the, for the Irish state. Uh, su support going into the banks in terms of uh, liquidity support and then capital support, further contraction, contractory budgets forced on, um, forced on the system uh, because of the nature of the crisis and not having resilience to, 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 to deal with it. That worsened the issue um, and ultimately led to the, the requirement for the, for, the, for the external support from the IMF and the EU. And then further contractory uh, and pro-cyclical actions had to be taken, which incidentally would, I think, be much worse if we hadn't had the, the external support. Um, and all this had a, an absolutely terrible human cost. Um, again, Simon, Simon sort of referred to that, Jones sort of referred to that. And that's still being felt by too many today. We have the ongoing misery of non-performing loans. Um, uh, not, not that there hasn't been a lot of progress in terms of non-performing loans. We have the ongoing open source of non-performing loans. And we have the housing crisis today. And again, the causes of the housing crisis are multifaceted. Um, but if we, if we look at the, the complete emergency hard stop of construction in, in 2008-09, when from 2011 to 2016, well, less than, the housing stock in Ireland increased by less than 9,000. In the first decade of the, of, of the 2000s, increased by more than half a million. In, in 2007, there were 74,000 homes built for loan. So a complete hard stop caused the difficulties from a fiscal perspective and has caused catastrophic difficulties in terms of the housing crisis today. So what's changed? Um, well, we've, we've been through a decade of, of, of crisis management. We're moving into a period of, I think, of what I would hope is crisis prevention or crisis mitigation. Um, we've had an international response uh, in terms of recognising it's been an international issue um, uh, with, a, with a very significant strengthening of the regulatory framework and the approach to supervision. That's absolutely been applied in, in Ireland, um, both through to, to, to the law, through the support of the office, and also in terms of the approach to central bank states and financial regulations. So we now have a much more assertive risk-based approach to supervision, which is underpinned by the credit for threat enforcement. We've had banking unions, so we have now have uh, the, the supervision of, uh, of all the uh, banks in the Eurozone under the auspices of ECB, which has in, in increased consistency um, and the independence of supervision uh, uh, across, across the Eurozone. And we've had numerous and very, very in-depth um, improvements in our consumer protection projects. So where does that leave us? From a prudential supervision, which is my uh, perspective, which is my responsibility, what we're looking to try and achieve is a resilient and, trust, and trustworthy financial system that serves the needs of the economy and its consumers over the long term. And what, what have we achieved? Well, we certainly have achieved a safer and sounder financial system. Um, and a certainly a safer and sounder banking system um, in terms of when we talk about the level of capital uh, versus the risk uh, that, they, uh, that they run. What we haven't yet achieved is the cultural shift um, that that's Simon refers to and what that, that which we in the Central Bank are working uh, very hard on. We've also taken forward-looking um, uh, macro prudential measures, uh, mortgage measures. Um, uh, we've in, in required more capital to be, to be held in banks. And, and you've seen probably over the last week the advice we've given to government about building resilience into the system, recognising the susceptibility of Ireland to the, to the economic cycle. So looking ahead, we definitely have a stronger um, uh, financial system. Uh, uh, I think safer, uh, think more resilient, um, but it's, it's getting increasingly complex again, it's growing in size again, partly because of, uh, because of Brexit, and 
we still have significant legacy issues in the I touched on culture, we talked about other issues in terms of investment in IT infrastructure, which is very interconnected and in an area that needs uh, considerable investment. And if we look at it from a global perspective, the level of global debt in the system is actually higher now than it was in 2009. Ireland still has the fourth highest household debt as a measure against income relative to the, to the, rest, of the, the rest, of, rest of Europe. That means that Ireland, and at a global level, there is still a great vulnerability to, to, to shocks, including interest rate shocks, and there's less room for policy measures um, to address uh, potential future shocks. And it is absolutely clear but there are some clouds on the horizon, that there will be future storms. Now we can hope that those storms will be not as severe as the last one, but there are storms there will be. And so building resilience now is absolutely critical to us uh, preventing or mitigating um, the challenges that we will face um, in the future. <coughs> the actions of the central bank are very much focused on that mission of protecting the public, protecting consumers, uh, and safeguarding stability. That is our mission, that's our public service mission. And what we're desperately trying to achieve is to deliver that greater resilience into the, into the system and to mitigate the risks I've talked about. I would, I would sincerely hope that if we are gathered in this room, all of us, in 10 years' time, that we do remember the lessons um, from the crisis. We still remember that those lessons. And that the storms that we will face in the Ukraine period, we will weather a bit better than the last crisis. But that will require continued diligence, it will require long memories, it will require that we build resilience today in the, in the, in the better times, and address the legacy issues that we, still, that we still face. But we do listen this time to alternative voices, to different voices that, that, that have different views. And I'm delighted by the diversity of both background um, and in other measures of the panel today. Um, and it will require us to think about the assumptions that we're relying on, both implicitly and explicitly, because not all of them will hold. Thank you. Thank you. rarely makes front page news and one might well wonder what poetry has to do with economics or indeed the financial crisis. It was very much in the headlines in July of this year however when the Bank of Ireland Cultural and Heritage Centre in College Green opened with the Seamus Heaney exhibition called Listen Now Again. This was one occasion at least when poetry and banking came together in a very interesting and important way. The title of the exhibition, Listen Now Again, is taken from Seamus Heaney's poem, The Rain Stick, in which he writes, You are like a rich man entering heaven through the ear of a raindrop. Listen now again. But what is Heaney asking the reader to listen to again here? On one level, it is the rain stick of the title. Up end the rain stick and what happens next is a music that you never would have known to listen for, he writes. On another level, however, Heaney is describing the way we engage with art itself and how its impact can remain undiminished for having happened once, twice, ten, thousand times before. Who cares if all the music that, trans that transpires is the fall of grit or dry seeds through a cactus, he asks. What matters is the making of the music itself and our ability to understand and to appreciate it no matter where or when, no matter how many times we might have heard it before. So Heaney's poem then seems to affirm Ezra Pound's notion that poetry is news that stays news. What it has to tell us is important no matter when we hear it, no matter when the poem was written, as long as we're willing to listen. Not all readers of poetry appreciate its value in this way, of course, and for many, the governments 615,000 euro contribution to the setting up of the Bank of Ireland Centre, the total cost was 2 million euro, isn't justifiable at a time when homelessness is higher than it has ever been in our capital city. Seamus Heaney's poetry and art in general may have a certain kind of value, aesthetic say, or even cultural, 
But how do we reconcile the idea of financial or economic capital on the one hand with aesthetic or cultural value on the other? In short, what is the relationship between poetry or art in general and money? Now this is a question that many writers have, have pondered. W.B. Yeats, for example, offers a searing critique of the tendency to focus on the accumulation of material wealth over the pursuit of cultural ideals in his poem, September 1913, which begins, What need you, being come to sense, but fumble in a greasy till and add the halfpence to the pence and prayer to shivering prayer until you have dried the marrow from the bone for men were born to pray and save romantic Ireland's dead and gone its with O'Leary in the grave. Yeats's poem was written in response to Dublin Corporation's decision not to build a gallery to house the Ulane collection of paintings in 19, 1913. Some critics, however, have said, I've read it as a text that's also informed by the Dublin lockout of 1913-14, when some 20,000 workers were locked out of their jobs in a dispute over their right to unionize. Yeats's poem doesn't refer to this event directly, but it does seem to, su to suggest, very problematically, that there is a distinction to be made between the value of art on the one hand and economic wealth on the other. But why should a city or a state spend money on art when so many of its citizens are hungry or homeless? While it is easy enough, perhaps, to sympathize with Yeats's depiction of the money-grubbing shopkeeper fumbling in a greasy till, it's hard to ignore the fact that this poem makes a claim that the state should invest in art even when many of its citizens are starving. W. H. Auden, partly in response to Yeats, famously said that poetry makes nothing happen. I believe, however, that one of its greatest values is to give us images out of which our sense of the world can be created but also deepened. Yeats's poetry often refers to contemporary events and people, and in this he may be said to be reflecting directly on the times he lived in. At the same time, it can be hard to work out precisely what he's saying or where he stands in relation to a particular historical moment. This is something that the contemporary poet Conor O'Callaghan has observed in relation to some recent Irish poetry. Reflecting on the changes that occurred in Ireland between the 1990s and 2013, O'Callaghan says, it's difficult to find direct correlations between social forces and poems. But poetry continues to happen, he says, in silence and solitude. Events like the financial crisis of 2008, he says, are often visible and audible as background. So in Yeats then, as with all poets perhaps, it could be argued that the background is always there, but sometimes we have to strain to hear it. Now this isn't always the case, and I would say uh, that in the last 10 years in particular, a number of our uh, poets in Ireland and elsewhere have worked to make the background of economic collapse and austerity a central subject in their work. Several Irish poets come to mind in this regard, including William Wall, Kevin Higgins, Dave Lorden, Sarah Clancy, Elaine Feeney, to name just a few writers, who have each in their own way sought to understand and critique the financial crisis in particular and its impact. The late Dennis O'Driscoll, who passed away in 2012, wrote some of the most prescient poems about the boom in the late 1990s, including a poem called Celtic Tiger, in which he wrote, Ireland's boom is in full swing. Rows of numbers set in a cloudless blue computer background prove the point. Outside, new antique pubs, young consultants, well-toned women, jealous slick men, drain long-necked bottles of imported beer. Where are they now, those men and women? It's such a pity that Dennis O'Driscoll isn't here to write about their demise, and more recently their precarious comeback. But in the last decade, and I think other poets, including those I've mentioned, others like Paul Durkin and Paula Meehan, have written in clear and uncompromising ways about the impact of the banking crisis and other recent crises on people's lives. Another important example here, I think, is that of the poet Kerry O'Brien, whose anthology, Looking at the Stars, Irish Writing in Aid of the Dublin Simon Community, which she co-edited with Alice Kinsella, I think this is a significant example of writers and poets coming together to use their work to raise funds to help those who have fallen on hard times, in part because of the fallout 
of the financial crisis of 2008. Now, the American poet Wallace Stevens once said that money is a kind of poetry. Um, but in one of her poems, the contemporary American poet Kay Ryan turns this around and says, poetry is a kind of money whose value depends upon reserves. It's not the paper it's written on or its self-announced denomination, but the bullion sweated from the earth and hidden, which preserves its worth. Nobody knows how this works, and how can it? Why does something stacked in some secret bank or cabinet, some miser's trove, far back, lambent, and gloated over by its golem, make us so solemnly convinced by the transaction when Mandelstam says gold even in translation? This poem is asking about the way that poetry is valued, but it also suggests that it takes time for its value to be determined. Its value depends upon reserves. While some contemporary poets responded very quickly to the economic crisis, others may yet be in the process of doing so, and there may be others again whose work's meaning in relation to the times we live in now may not be fully appreciated for some time to come. As Heaney puts it in the poem I quoted at the beginning, what happens next is a music that you never would have known to listen for. But it's important, I think, whether we are critics, bankers, economists, <coughs> poets, or politicians, that we continue to pay attention, not just to the headlines, but what lies behind and beneath them. Thank you. Thank you. Five absolutely fabulous, very diverse uh, presentations. We were a few minutes late starting and we've had five speakers rather than four, so we're going to go on until 8.15 if the discussion uh, uh, lends itself to that. Um, could I uh, remind you the acoustics in this room are not good, so uh, everybody, if you are asking a question, you do need to use a mic. And we have Eve with a mic here and we have another mic uh, with Francesca. Um, the one thing I would like you to do is a courtesy to our panel is simply to introduce yourself so they know who's asking the question. And again, so we can get as many questions in as possible. Please, we don't want a statement from the floor. We want a clear, direct, short question. So our first question, you just put some hands up. So there's two at the back there, one in the middle. We'll take those three and then we'll come over to the other side. So two, and the lady at the back, and then the gentleman in here in the middle. Please, sir. Um, my name is Connor Casey. I'm a PhD student at the School of Law here in Trinity. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. They're all very interesting. Um, this question is directed uh, primarily, I think, at uh, Deputy Burton and, and Mr. Carswell. Um, just to what extent do you think that the critiques, um, there was a lot of critique uh, in the aftermath of the crisis, focused at the Oireachtas as an institution, um, people saying that both in the run up to the crisis, the Iraq has failed in its role as a scrutinizer of the executive and administrative bodies, and then afterwards that a lot of the most important decisions were made unilaterally by a cabinet, the guarantee itself, and that that was symptomatic of the weakness uh, of the Iraq as an institution. So, I'm just wondering if you think there's any uh, you know, validity to these critiques and. Um, if you think the Iraqis is in a stronger place now, having learned possibly. Okay, thank you, Connor. We're going to hold that and we'll take a few questions and then we'll come back to uh, uh, John. Thank you. Please. My name is Pauline Cadell. I'm a member of the public. Um, we used to have institutions called um, building societies, which provided housing for people and they provided housing for people with people who actually saved with those institutions. You had to actually save with the institution in order to be able to get a loan for a mortgage. And the people who saved were the people who controlled those institutions. There was no such thing as huge bankers' bonuses or pay. They just did not exist. They, those institutions were consumed by the banks and no longer exist. The biggest ones, Irish Parliament, and Irish Nationwide, I think I can't remember any others. Okay. Could you just, what's your question? Uh, my, you question is, question. my question is, it, it was interesting that, that the credit unions, which are similarly owned by people, were the most trusted institutions who are sitting on quite phenomenal amounts of savings, and yet they are not allowed to lend to their own 
um, members for mortgages. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. We, the, there was a question in here in the middle. I think this gentleman here in a blue shirt, Eve, down, down, down in the middle. Sorry, we'll get the mic to you. And, and then we'll come back to our panel. Please, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rafi Kamordia. I have a simple question. Is there a danger in analysing the banking crisis that we tend to blame a whole range of factors rather than a specific, specific factor? In the Wundern Report of 2008, it was very clearly marked out that it was the bank directors who were responsible for the crisis, and it was the failure of the then authorities, mainly the central bank, which failed in their responsible role. Are we being, by, by, by generalizing that it was an international crisis, are we taking away where the blame should be? Thank you very much. Obviously, we'll let Ed uh, uh, answer that question. So, thank you for those questions. Joan, would you mind if we start it with you and then we'll go across the panel just to respond <coughs> to one or all of those? And uh, would you mind if I just re uh, briefly replied to sure. one of Philip's poems? Oh, yes. And this is a poem by, or a song by Woody Guthrie. And it's about a bank robber in Oklahoma called Pretty Boy Floyd. And basically, uh, the, the, the important verse is where he says, and it just came to me as Philip was talking there, the some men rob you with a six gun, uh, and some with a fountain pen. <laughs> so that's all I'll say about bankers. Uh, and that's been my favorite uh, song, poem about bankers. And you can still hear it uh, sung occasionally today. Um, in relation to the first question about the Oireachtas and Oireachtas oversight, um, the Oireachtas has about 20 committees. They're not particularly, if you like, uh, well equipped. And they do, I would say, a limited job of providing oversight and questioning on different issues. Um, I think the era of the bank crash was also an era of essentially the central bank of the time being basically be above and beyond questioning and maybe Rafiq might be able to say something about this because it was a remote institution it wasn't in as they are nowadays in the European supervisory system but also following a report by Michael McDowell in the late 90s there was a decision to split the regulatory function from the central bank uh, which was about, you know, securing, if you like, sorry, secure, <laughs> securing the currency and to set up uh, the Irish uh, Fiscal Regulatory Authority and post the crash on lots of different uh, advice that was put back together again. And I think it's now given a focus, but I would say regulation is weak in a lot of areas, particularly in relation to ordinary uh, if you like, ordinary citizens and consumers. Regulation in their favour is, in my view, quite limited. Uh, the second thing, really, is that there are a lot of SMEs which are not well served by our banking institutions. And uh, thirdly, um, we have a lot of unregulated entities, dark entities, in the banking system nowadays of almost every country about which we know little, but which are very powerful, and really, I don't know the answer to how, what the regulatory reach is in relation to them. Uh, I agree uh, with um, the woman who spoke about uh, the credit unions. I think there's 13, 14 billion in savings in the credit unions, and they are an institution of choice for many people. Uh, but there's a long-running war between regulators and credit unions, and without a doubt, there have been lots of problems in different credit unions, but people do trust them. And amazingly as well, there's a German uh, popular bank, which serves a lot of rural areas and less well-off areas, called Sparkhausen. And in fact, after the war in Germany, was one of the key generators of uh, credit for businesses throughout the regions and the country. They've been offering for ages to run a number of projects in Ireland, uh, which uh, would of course have to be uh, supported uh, by the Irish government. Uh, and for some reason, 
within the system, there is absolute opposition to that model. I think it may well be that the central bank and indeed uh, the Department of Finance have decided that the recovery of what are called the pillar banks, really at this stage, uh, Bank of Ireland and AIB, comes before everything else. Personally, I think that's short-sighted. Um, in relation to uh, Rafiq's uh, comment about the bank directors, I would say the other set of people who should be in the job as well are auditors. And I think it's a real problem in a global financial system that you now have a small concentrated set of auditing firms who are expected to do everything and certify everything but can't go back to the simple principle which auditing is based on, which is a true and a fair view. In other words, a reasonable perspective on, is, is this company, is this business good? Is it likely to survive? Is its balance sheet reasonably fair and accurate? And I mean, really, uh, the big four, I think the time has come to really in many ways break them up globally, not just in Ireland, and actually have, if you like, auditors who perhaps specialise in auditing and don't do 10 other, don't sell 10 other services uh, to the firms. And I think, you know, that might make a difference. Obviously more, in a certain sense, in regard to commas, educated directors. But I think one of the things that happened in the Irish system uh, and in the Irish banking system was groupthink on a ferocious basis. So you couldn't question anything. Uh, maybe nowadays people question everything as a reaction to that. Uh, but, you know, I wonder. Um, I wouldn't say we're absolutely uh, protected from future shocks. Thank you very much. Bill. Could we maybe, uh, Ed might want to respond, uh, and then anybody else who'd like to come in? But, uh, a, a, a few comments. Um, uh, to, to the question specifically, and then to, to, to Joan's comment. So, on, on the question on credit, credit unions, Credit unions can and do uh, uh, lend um, uh, for, for home loans. Um, they have significant headroom uh, relative to the to the limits, the, the prudent limits that are, are in place um, that would uh, that are, uh, allow them to, to, to lend. We are shortly will be consulting on <coughs> to allow them to, to loosen that a little, but there is uh, they are well able to to, 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 to lend for, for, for home loans. Um, taking the uh, Holohan report, so in terms of what I was trying to do in, in, my, in my remarks um, was to try and give a bit of context. So um, there absolutely were very significant issues um, in, in, in Ireland, and I'll, I'll come back to them in, in, in a second. But the issues in Ireland, the build-up um, of, of the bubble in Ireland, the, 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 the factors that led to the crisis uh, were myriad. Um, and there was a commonality around them in terms of how they impacted um, across the globe. And indeed, I, I refer to um, the ECB taking over back to bank and supervision. ECB hasn't taken over bank and supervision um, from 2014-15 because of Ireland, because of the issues in the Irish banks. It's taken over supervision um, because there was a global banking crisis and there was a European uh, uh, bank, uh, banking failure. In terms of what the Honohan report talked to, talk, talk to uh, it referred to, uh, in summary, it's a very, it's a very good report, it's anyone who's I would urge Persian to read it, and it's very important that we remember um, uh, the lessons from it. But in, in, in very summary form, it talks about macro, macroeconomic and budgetary failures. It, it, talks, it, it, it refers to um, the fuel that was being put on the fire as we were overheating, and the reliance on the transient income, which was construction, uh, at that time. There is also transient income today, um, uh, particularly around corporate tax, that we need to be mindful of, uh, and that's very much behind the Governor's letter to the, um, the Finance Minister about building uh, resilience and running some degree of budget surface, surface. The Honohan Report also talks about regulatory and supervisory failures. Um, that's again the philosophy globally, uh, but there were a catastrophic failures in, in, in Ireland. We have done an enormous amount um, to, to address those failings, and we have a much more intensive, intrusive approach to both the reg regulation and the supervision thereof. Um, but I wouldn't claim perfection, and I think we have to be continue to be diligent to make sure that we spot risk and, and, and address risk and act on risk as we see them. 
I just, in terms of a, a couple of comments on um, Joan's, Joan's remarks, um, there, there is no conspiracy to protect um, the Irish Bank, with the, 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 the ARB, Bank of Ireland, uh, with, within, within, the, within the central bank. What, we, what we're committed to is making sure that the system as a whole um, is safer, is more trustworthy, um, and is resilient. Um, and we would absolutely be supportive of uh, other, a greater degree of competition in, in the retail banking market. Um, and, but we are also making sure uh, that those banks that we have here in, in, in Ireland are safer, are sounder, and are improving their cultures, um, are becoming more diverse, and are less subject to, to groupthink. <coughs> and in reference to the, the sparkasm, um, we have, we've, uh, there is absolutely no issue with the sparkasm coming uh, to, to Ireland from a, 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 and creating a, a, a bank in Ireland, but they need the capital to set, set one up. Um, and they need to be able to fund, to, to, to fund it. And that, that, I understand, is a sticking point in terms of they haven't come with capital or liquidity in, in, with, which, with which to fund it. Um, and I'll, uh, we'll say. I think Philip wants to come in here. Yes. I don't know, Simon, if you also Just want to uh, briefly, just to say, I, mean, I think uh, the first and third questions concerned uh, the issues of critique, critique of institutions, and uh, the issue of blame and responsibility. And I think uh, I'm just grateful to Joan for mentioning First of all, the great example of Anne Enright in, in her presentation, and then the example of Woody Guthrie, two writers, two artists, uh, who, who never shirk from you know, critiquing um, institutions of state, or, 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 you, you know, especially um, where there are wrongs of this magnitude being, being, being committed. Um, also just to say that um, the example of Woody Guthrie is a really pertinent one, because many of the writers I spoke about at the end are very closely involved in a performance poetry scene. So it's not only that their work exists on the page, but also in, uh, in vocal performance and there's a connection with music there as well. Um, but these artists, I think, and Joan brought this out very strongly, um, are really committed to the idea that we should critique um, the, you know, the politicians, the bankers who you know, contributed to this uh, crisis. Um, and I think that's, that's it's really worth uh, remembering. Thank you, Philip. Simon? Um, thank you. <clears throat> just to address the two questions, just in relation to uh, criticism of Oireachtas oversight. I, I'd say there really wasn't much Oireachtas oversight, in fact, where um, I don't really recall any opposition parties telling finance ministers in the run up to the crash that they were spending too much money in their budget and they need their brain uh, to pull back. Um, and I think that was one of the contributing factors. With regard to actual oversight by institutions, I think there's a, there's a belief out there that the crisis began in September 2008. The crisis started years before with the build up in credit in the sector. And, uh, a fun parlor game I used to enjoy when I interviewed bankers, I said, tell me the year that you think if you'd stopped lending, we would have been saved. And often they would say 2003 and 2004. And I don't recall anyone saying in the period of 2003 and 2005, with the exception of some uh, contrarians who were gradually ridiculed and eventually stopped saying the things they were saying, uh, that, that it was all getting a bit too hot and to calm down. So I'm not sure the Oireachtas was providing any oversight. Where it was providing oversight of a financial regulator, uh, financial regulatory functions was in relation to consumer protection. There was a focus on making sure, uh, ironically, customers weren't being overcharged or ripped off. So that famous line, I don't know what a tracker mortgage is, it should actually, I don't know how safe my bank is. I'm not sure the money is going to be there or going to withdraw. That's the question we should have been asking ourselves. And actually the regulators themselves were asking that question because the focus was on the consumer. I thought Pauline raised a very interesting point about building societies, they're actually gone. They're no longer there. Uh, so there's a giant gap in the market and there is a huge lack of competition in Ireland. And the extreme is, oh my God, if we have too much competition, that's gonna cause the same problems as before. Uh, and that's true, but there's absolutely a room, there's a big gap in the market. I mean, the Education Building Society, as its name suggests, was set up because teachers couldn't get home loans. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's an awful lot of teachers now who can't get home loans. So there is obviously an institution there, if it has the capital and if it meets all the requirements of the regulator. But there is a gap, I think, between credit unions and banks, and there does need to be competition, not the wild runaway competition that we had in the boom years. And just in, with regard to are we at risk of blaming a whole range of factors, I think that's a really good question. And again, it was a fun part of the game to ask uh, Patrick Holman, where he'd come out with all this list of things, and it was a big list, and you know all these factors, and said, well, how much worse was Ireland compared to everywhere else? And, how Ireland specific were some of these issues. 
And I think that if you consider the international crisis to be the trigger, and we had all our own ingredients, and it was kind of this vanilla property crash, which is kind of embarrassing in hindsight, but it was so obvious, it was in plain sight there. Uh, and we all kind of knew it, really, I think. But I think there's a whole interesting debate as to the legal responsibility and the moral responsibility. The legal responsibility falls on a very small number of people, and yes, you're absolutely right, the banks, boards and management, the buck stops there. And they have been in such a benign environment for so long that they didn't see risk anymore. And in fact, there's a comment made by the chief executive of AIB privately to a politician who said that, you know, I have too much risk capital, I don't know what to do with it. Uh, and that shows that was 2006. And so they had too much money on, on their hands because there wasn't enough uh, rules in place to make sure that they set aside enough for a rainy day. So I think the legal responsibility is a very small group, moral responsibility, that's where you get into that we all party line. You know, I took two more, two holidays instead of one a year. I, I changed my car every year instead of every three years like I, before, like I did before. So I guess responsibility filters out to us all to a degree, but at, at the very, uh, at the point of actually asking who is responsible, banks, boards and management, there's a hierarchy there. The banks, boards and management, the failure of the regulator to watch them, the failure of the government to watch the regulator. And I think that's a good hierarchy. And then you can throw in auditors, you can throw in property markets, you can throw in the media as well. Thank you very much. We'll take another round of questions. So, so there's a gentleman here uh, in a blue shirt, and actually a lady in purple, but you obviously have to go. Well, uh, I think uh, it's been answered. Powerful answer. It's the politicians. Very good. So, so there's a gentleman here in the blue. And then we'll come to you, Hannah, to just, we'll move it over. Yeah. Mine is a short question. And your, your name is? is? David Timoney, I'm just a member of the public. Uh, my question is around the estimated net cost of the banking crisis. I mean, there's a lot of figures, 64 billion, 100 billion, but obviously uh, we're recovering some money from our ownership of the banks and uh, now it's all. So just a quick estimate of the net cost uh, of banking. Thank crisis. you very much. Could you pass the microphone on over? There's a lady uh, there with her hand up. Good mind, Thank you. Hi, my name is Margaret Rogers. I have my question relates to the thinking behind the headlines. Ireland has the uh, rather shameful reputation of being the most unequal society in Europe, or economy in Europe, with children and women being predominantly mis mis disproportionately represented and uh, impacted. And I suppose that would be attributed to the economic model that is uh, you know, supported through the banking system and through the political system. And I wonder whether the panel would comment on what they would think would rectify that situation because in what we're, you know, we euphemistically referring to as a recovery, I mean, that situation is actually worsening. So no, uh, very, very good question. I'm sure you're coming back to that in another behind the headlines that I'll tell you about in a moment. One more question. I think there was another person. Oh, it's this gentleman here. So if you can just pass the mic straight ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Hi, my name is uh, James O'Dowd. My question relates to a uh, point Simon made about uh, 333. If we own most of PTSB and a large chunk of IV, why don't we just run them as we see fit? And is that something that the central bank will allow, would Frankfurt allow? And as a quick addendum to that, if I can get a mortgage in Belgium uh, for 1.8% with KBC, why can't, why the best I can do here with KBC is 3%. That doesn't make any sense. Why, why can't we uh, change that? Good. Thank you very much, James. I don't know who wants to kick this off. Simon, do you want to, who's got the figures? That, um, I know they were in your tool. Yeah, the figures as it stands, the net cost, and um, this is just a monetary cost. There are lots of other costs, and um, so we shouldn't be popping champagne corks or anything like that. It's 30 to 32 billion, roughly, I think, it's going to come in at. Like, most of Anglo and Nationwide is gone, that's 35 billion. Nam is talking about a um, profit of three, 3 to 4 billion, I think. But Nam, to get where it got to, it took the loans were, were, were shaved off by about 40 billion. So it's minus 40 billion plus 3 or 4 billion. <laughs> so it's, again, no champagne. But um, the, uh, the net cost. I mean, I think it's totally irrelevant, actually, the figure that it costs. I think it's actually a distraction to what we should be talking about, which is what the second question referred to, which is um, the metrics. And I was kind of, after four years in the States, I, was, I came back and I, even in my own paper, the reports, it's like this constant focus on economic metrics. It's like, it, really, is that what we're doing still uh, on this? And 
you know, the, the better metrics are the 10,000 in emergency accommodation, 4,000 children, uh, the 34,000 people who haven't paid anything on their mortgage for two years or more. That's a pretty big metric that hasn't really been focused at all. The, the small number of cases going through the personal insolvency courts because the banks are dragging their heels uh, and stopping people from getting deals. When I say deals, they're in houses that they can't afford the mortgages on and the banks are objecting with, with, ever, with whatever legal mechanism that they can throw up. Like they are throwing spanners in, in, in the works, stand in engines, whatever metaphor you use, to stop deals being done. And those are the kind of metrics I think we need to be watching. On the point of well, why, can't I just get, why can't we just get our bank to be introduced the 363 model. Uh, we don't run the banks. They're not our banks. Again, that's a... It's, it's not our people. It's, they run, we run part of them, but they have to meet all sorts of fiscal duties uh, to their other shareholders. We own part of AIB, we own part of Bank of Ireland, we own part of the TSB, but we, are not, we don't run them. And the question about mortgage rates being so much cheaper in Europe and being so much more expensive here is a really good point, and that's a really good question as to why that isn't the case, and Ed should answer that. <laughs> so, so I, I, I focus, in the interest of time, I'll focus um, purely on, on, on that question. And the, the fundamental reason for that is uh, that mortgage lending in Ireland is different to lending in Belgium. Um, and the, the figures that Simon, that Simon's used there, um, 34,000, I think you referred to, um, it's 46,000 people in it. Or accounts in in unoccupied homes that are in the rooms, greater than 90 days. Uh, there are a, a very large number of people in the rooms, greater than five, five years, that are not engaging uh, with with their with their banks in terms of trying to sort sort it out. So a huge amount of restructuring activity in in, in Ireland. It's simply, and um, I appreciate this is a somewhat unpopular message. Simply the fact that lending um, in Ireland is higher risk. And there should be um, a, a higher margin there. There is actually very little barriers to entry um, uh, in terms of new entrants into into uh, into a banking market in, in the eurozone. You don't even have to have a physical presence. Um, and so, if if those margins were so attractive um, uh, to to other to other possible entrants in, into the Irish market. Um, that could, could lend at 1.8 in, in, in a safe way, that they know that they would get their money back, then we would see we would see new entrants in there. So there's a, there's a fundamental issue that we do still continue need to sort out in terms of non-form loans and the terrible tragedy that that is. Um, but that that is inhibiting um, uh, lending in Ireland. It means banks have to hold higher capital in Ireland, um, and the risk associated with lending in, 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 in Ireland is, is still unfortunately higher. Thank you. Does anybody want to come back to Margaret's question about unequalness? I don't know if Philip or, or, or Joan or uh, Antonia do. Uh, it, it was the one, uh, the most unequal economy uh, in, in Europe. Thanks, yeah, just to, um, thanks for that. Just to, to make a brief point on that, coming from the 19th century, which is possibly not a, of, of direct interest to you, but um, I spend a, a, a lot of time um, researching uh, women's lives and um, the legislative barriers and financial barriers and social barriers and, and barriers imposed by the church um, which made their lives so difficult and a lot of my research looks at how um, women struggle to overcome those barriers to get on with working or running their business um, and providing for their families um, and I was, I'm sure lots of people read um, Fergus Finley this morning talking about his uh, retirement from um, uh, Bernardo's. Um, he was saying that uh, he took the job in 2005 um, and uh, if anybody had told him um, that he would be leaving the job in 2018 with, uh, with 4,000 homeless children, he, he simply wouldn't have believed it. Um, so I couldn't agree more that that, that should be um, something of the highest priority. Mm. Thank you. Would, uh, Senator Barrett. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say, um, uh, obviously Sean Barrett is, uh, is a colleague and was very involved, so I'm inviting Sean maybe just to begin to wrap things up a little bit, but please. You're, you're very kind, and thank you, Jim. I was on the Senate committee, uh, the Arabs committee, Simon came in as a witness, and we saw Jamie around the House. Uh, much of what we found uh, would corroborate what you've said here uh, this evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On banks, we asked the financial regulator, Mr. Neary, what's the difference between a bank, uh, dry cleaners, 
and bicycle shops, and he looked a bit bewildered. We rescue banks when they go broke. Banking is not entrepreneurship. It's working on a government guarantee, which they called in for the 64 billion. I would totally oppose their attempts to get bonuses uh, until the money is paid back that Simon has mentioned. This is not entrepreneurship. It's hijacking of entrepreneurship. As I said, the bicycle shop and the dry cleaner are much better examples than banks. The banks are in the run into their troubles. They shut down an academic journal, the Irish Banking Review, which economists and banks cooperated in. Uh, they tried to uh, run Morgan Kelly, the economist who found out about the bank. They tried to run him to ground. People like Professor James Mean and Professor Alan Ryan from here, Professor Paddy Lynch, uh, economics professors on bank boards were never replaced by people. So they went out to distance themselves from economics and the way in which they conducted themselves uh, certainly illustrated that. They are serial offenders. We had the Insurance Corporation of Ireland, we had the dirt scandal, and we had secret funds for bank uh, directors in the, in the Caribbean. So they require substantial reform. I realize that Ed has imposed uh, 65.5 million in fines in the last decade on financial institutions. The period before the crisis was at zero. You didn't get light touch regulation, you got no supervision. And the central bank has an absolutely vital role to play. And you know, three people like Philip Lane, who is here, of course, uh, and they've, they've gotten a grip on this now, but it was a, a system which was bound to fail and did fail. Not only do you have the problem in the UK where Her Majesty removed Sir Fred the Shred's title, he's just Fred the Shred now. Uh, you had, uh, we were blamed in Germany for the debt for bank, which is located in the ILC, and it cost the German taxpayer about 90 billion. So the, the, the mismanagement of banks and bank regulation in Ireland has been a huge uh, cost to us. Auditors, we have serious problems. The auditors were some of the least impressive people who appeared, nearly as unimpressive as bankers. They didn't see the banks they were auditing were broke. So we said, well, what about your firm audited Lehman Brothers and your firm audited Northern Rock? Did you ring up the partners? Uh, no. So what you have is a franchise system, a McDonald's for bean counters. It means nothing. Uh, you, and Mr. Barnier, when he's finished escorting Mrs. May off the premises, has proposals because of the role of auditors uh, in 2010, that uh, audit should be limited to six years. They pushed it out to ten. Two auditors for financial institutions. Uh, and he also was concerned, one of the questions about inequality, the role of the accounting profession in facilitating massive worldwide tax avoidance schemes. Uh, the central bank at the time was not fit for purpose. Unfortunately, uh, they had, two, in 2008, a cake, a number of people standing around the cake. This was to celebrate 10 years of the euro currency. It was presented as a piece of cake. The design faults in the euro have only been remedied subsequently. Uh, and uh, there should have been analysis. Saying it's a political decision, that's not enough. We've got 8 billion apart in structural funds. All uh, decisions have an economic cost. And we didn't properly assess whether we wanted to be in the euro currency uh, or not. The Department of Finance was briefing ministers within months of the bank collapse that Irish banks were well capitalised to good quality assets and were regulated to the highest international <coughs> standards. Uh, we found that 7% of senior staff in the Department of Finance had qualifications in economics at master's level uh, or above. Uh, the, the equivalent figure in Canada was 60. Canada did not have uh, a banking crisis. So we've got to really assess uh, how we train people and the role of universities in having contrarian voices uh, in dealing with these matters. Is, I think the central bank, as Evan said, is reform, it is a much tougher organisation. I think every member of this audience should support the central bank. Don't give those bankers uh, the bones. I do worry, uh, for my uh, concluding remarks, on what's happening in the Department of Finance. The Economic Management Council has disbanded. Uh, the Department of Public Expansion and Reform has no separate minister. The increase in capital spending announced on the February 16th in Sligo in the NDP was 23.5%. That's back to the good old bad old days again. And they've gotten away remarkably likely uh, for, uh, with criticisms from the IMF about the way we appraise capital projects in Ireland. They say they don't intend to reform and they say they're broadly compliant. 
Now if you read the 15 major criticisms, which the economists will be doing in uh, Wexford at the weekend. So I would be worried that slippage in the Department of Finance, I factually of the Fiscal Advisory Council, should have drawn their attention to that in February. They panicked a bit in recent times. But if you don't control spending, there is nothing left uh, on budget day. The question about inequality that people were interested in, Jane. Yes, I, I will understand. <laughs> if you print vast quantities of money, as Mr. Mr. Draghi is doing, to prop up financial markets, and you 64 billion gone, which you could have used for other purposes, yes, inequality gains. What comes out of this is moral hazard, the people who bore no part of the cost themselves, lobbying and rent seeking, which is not a productive uh, activity, uh, and regulatory capture. Regulators being captured by the sectors they're supposed to be in, to regulate in the public interest. So there are huge uh, problems there. Uh, briefly on the Oireachtas, uh, uh, Owen Murphy, condemned for being posh boy, Susan O'Keefe, uh, they helped us write most of the report, two extremely good uh, public representatives. They did try, and there wasn't a cent in it for the people who sat on that committee for two years, and they got to the bottom of a lot of the issues uh, that we discussed here. Remy Kennelly, going back to poets, he's back in the stole now, he said that uh, when he was growing up there as a boy, that the dominant institutions were the local bank manager, uh, the Catholic Church, and uh, FIFO, and the GAA. And he said, now there's only the GAA left. <laughs> <laughs> Time, unless our panel want to make any final responses, Joan, have the last word. Unless uh, Edder or Simon, yes. So just. I just want to make uh, two points. Uh, one about um, there being no critique, uh, if you like, of government spending in the era of coming up uh, to the crash. I wrote and campaigned and lobbied, particularly with the trade union movement, constantly on things called tax expenditures, whereby people like very highly paid lawyers and others who, if they invested in property, they could all, automatically write off pretty much the bulk of their tax liability. And there was the ridiculous uh, scenario uh, where when I got tables eventually from the uh, revenue commissioners, there were quite a lot of people on million plus annual incomes who in those days paid absolutely no tax at all because of the benefit of tax shelters. Here in Ireland, this was nothing to do with going abroad. This was about essentially usually investing in property and taking tax breaks. Uh, so I think that area is very important. Uh, I think one area that has not been uh, addressed, if you like, either by the Central Bank or the European Union, and is, if you like, one of the aftermaths of the crash. To keep a modern society functioning, you have to have proper capital investment, whether it's the bridges in Genoa, or whether it's housing in Ireland that people require. And there does need to be a reform and a recalculation of what deficit, the ban on deficit spending, and the inhibition around deficit spending, which is correct. But if you can't actually house your people, and if you can't invest in absolutely necessary infrastructure, the World Bank the current chairman, Dr. Kim, recently apologized for the failure of the World Bank to invest in people, as opposed to the big loan projects that we recall. And I think in Ireland, we, we need to see, can we be part of a European solution to that enormous uh, dilemma? And it really is a dilemma. And just let me say on equality, the, uh, pre, the, the, the pre-tax situation in Ireland in terms of income, because of now the significant numbers of people clustered in low-paid, precarious employment. What we need to do in relation to that, I think, as a society, it's not a party political point, is move to a living wage. When I was punished, I set up the Low Pay Commission. Uh, it took a lot of persuasion of the Department of Finance to, as it were, allow that. And let me say as well, 
when you look at our social welfare, and the OECD and others have done the uh, figures on this, our uh, post-social welfare support situation remains that risks of poverty, I'm not saying they don't exist, are massively reduced in Irish society. Key to that is pensions. And I would say this to Ed, I thought the uh, Governor of the Central Bank's recent proposal about an SSIA was very interesting. I actually think, uh, given the fact that the government is now postponing for eight to ten years the top of additional pension saving, the Celtic saver, that perhaps the Governor of the Central Bank, that that could become a pension related product, not simply uh, in his original suggestion for the rent for, if you like, the rainy day, because I think that's difficult to predict. But if it was uh, if it was an investment saving product, which in turn created a development bank for housing, which could lend for housing development long term into the Irish economy, I actually think we could partly, using if you like the better capacities of finance, to in fact really address the housing crisis, because we just need to get scale to take some of the misery out of people's lives. I, I, I was at a housing lounge yesterday where 34 people got houses, a lot of whom I knew, I know them over a long period of time, and the sheer joy and happiness, and you know, and the wonder and the beauty of the houses that were, they're going to be able to rent for the rest of their lives. But there's no, you know, we actually need to do that in numbers of around 20,000 a year. And we have to accept, you know, in, in a, I grew up in a rented house, but I know that among quite a lot of my political colleagues, and maybe among people in banks and so on, there's, there's a slight kind of almost shame attached to being in social housing. When in fact lots of people at different stages of their lives, maybe all during their lives because they have a disability, they don't have the resources to actually buy a house. There's nothing wrong with social housing. There's nothing wrong with people who have to use social housing. And we need to get over that. Maybe we also need to think as well, as some of the housing cooperatives are now doing, to look at shared, uh, if you like, supervision by people who are social housing tenants of where they're living, so that issues that other people see with social housing come to be resolved. Thanks very much, Joan. I think Ed wanted to just to event, wrap things up very quickly, final words, if you, if, or no? Well, I mean, I, I, just a, a, a couple of comments that come back to the, to the Senator. So, um, a, a, a resolvability, um, removing the uh, contingent support that's there from the taxpayer is absolutely front and centre of what we're trying to achieve. We've made good progress in it, but uh, there, is, there is still a bit more to be done. Uh, we've done a huge amount of work on accountability. We're doing more on accountability. Um, and I fully agree with the view that we need to listen to the different uh, voices. I think in terms of some of the, um, what we talked about, what's been raised, are actually some, some interesting political choices that need to be made in terms of what, what, the, the, what we spend money, money on today. And I fully agree with Joan, and uh, this is more of a, a, a personal view. Uh, Ireland, and indeed the, the, the West as a whole, faces a massive demographic challenge um, over the, uh, the actually the, the relatively near term, um, and there is absolutely work that needs to be done in terms of thinking about pension provision um, as 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 we age, and I said that should be dealt with as a as an as an urgent issue. I said, Simon, final word or no? Okay, well let me just wrap it up. I want to do so by making a few announcements. Firstly, say uh, our term of events has begun. On the 24th of September, Professor Humi Baba from Harvard uh, will be speaking, de delivering our annual Humanities Horizons le uh, lecture on the topic of uh, uh, migration. Um, now that's operating waiting list, but we'll broadcast it, we'll obviously live stream it. Uh, our next Behind the Headlines on the 11th of October is part of a new series called Trinity and the Changing City. And the first actual discussion will be the Dublin uh, housing crisis. So we're actually going to come back and look in some detail at some of the issues, particularly that Joan flagged uh, there. On the 18th of October, uh, a new lecture series begins called 1918 and the New Europe. Again, that's free. You're all very, very welcome. And last but not least, I just want to flag our annual Edmund Burke lecture which will be delivered on the 30th of October by the poet Paul Muldoon. 
um, and that I think registration is opening uh, for that tomorrow. Definitely. These things fill up almost overnight, folks. So if you're interested in coming to any of our events, obviously it's wonderful to be able to welcome you. I thank you all. It's a bit steamy in here. Yeah. It feels like the middle of summer. You've been extremely patient. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the great questions. I'd like to thank my team who always make things run so smoothly. But above all, I'd like to thank our panelists and Senator Barrett. Thank you, Sean.